Spirit Sessions podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love soundbite. Join us where I'll help you find your true spiritual home, where every single aspect of you is a holy ground. Hi everyone, Katie here. This podcast is intended to inspire you, educate you, and most importantly, support you on your journey towards knowing who you really are, that inner self, that inner teacher. I am not a psychologist or a medical doctor and do not offer professional health or medical advice on this podcast. If you're suffering from any kind of psychological or medical issue, Please do the right thing and seek help from your qualified health professional. All right, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to Spirit Sessions. I'm here with the amazing Nicole Frolic. Welcome to Spirit Sessions. We're so excited to have you. It's good to be here, Katie. Thanks for having me. So I was saying before we started that I kind of recognized you in a way, and I think the topic matter that that we're going to dive into is connective in the sense of, I have this theory that when people have explored their inner child and their shadow and understand the importance of the goddess, that we are sort of like a lost community that's finding one another again. And I know these are topics that are really near and dear to your own journey. And so I think I'd love to just start off for our listeners, giving them an understanding of what you mean by what is this inner child that you specialize in? Well, it's the, the inner child is the part of us that usually gets repressed and hidden over many years due to the inability to cope with certain traumas. But it's not just about our traumas. It's also about our joy. It's about our creativity It's about our ability to play and be in the flow with this entire universe. And so the inner child is this part of us that is always alive within us. But if we are not connected to it and in communication with our own inner child, where there is literally a dialogue back and forth of listening and speaking, we become really disconnected with a very important part of us that is... Uh, needed in order to do our manifestation, our creation, our ability to be feel connected to this life, the joy. And it's also about really understanding we do so much conscious work as we become adults, but the inner child really resonates strongly within our subconscious mind. And so if we don't go back in and reconnect and reestablish and nurture the relationship with our inner child, In order to get our attention, the inner child will start making choices subconsciously that end up sabotaging a lot of our conscious work. And therefore, um, there is no other option than to turn inward, uh, unless you're okay just continuing going down that route. (laughs) Yeah, I love this. So I I have often said, if you don't work with this inner child, it's like a little kid pulling at your pant leg. And then if you don't listen, then it will like start tearing down the walls of your house. And so in your experience, I know this is what you do is help people connect to this part of themselves. How do you see this show up for people who aren't giving their inner child? Like, how does it show like for our listeners, what does it look like when it's like, "Mm, okay, that might be the inner child that you're not giving what it needs. So how do you see that showing up in your experience? Well, one of the first signs is that uh, no matter what you're trying, if you're following like the rule book of trying to create the life of your dreams, your relationships, all of that, and everything just keeps falling apart, or you find yourself in the exact same patterns over and over and over again, it's time to start looking at your inner child. Like that is probably one of the most telltale signs. And also if you're really avoiding your own emotional needs, 
and you're just trying to push through life and you're just trying to get things done, a lot of times that I can see as there's a need to go inward because that is coming from a place of even further disconnection of the inner child. But I would say repetitive patterns that you want, that you think should be stopping based off your conscious work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just keep showing up. And so you just can't seem to break free of Mm -hmm. the sabotaging patterns, or even if they don't look like sabotaging patterns to you, but they just, things just keep falling apart in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that, that, That is, I think a big telltale sign. So yeah, it's so many of our experience as well. And I think there's this misunderstanding that the subconscious is only the darkness and that it's only something traumatic or bad that happened to you. But as you mentioned, it's also all of your untapped gifts and talents. And so Mm -hmm. how have you seen it show up that when someone starts, and we'll talk in a moment about how, but as people start to connect to the inner child, what have you seen in terms of the positive outcomes? like miracles. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> I want to hear. Like for instance, my client I have an inner child course and I have clients that will go through that and we'll work together one-on-one sometimes as I help them go through the course on their own. And um for instance, one of my clients, she has been doing deep inner child work, struggling to connect to that playful, joyful side, but through completing the course and then also I have a very shamanic exam, so to speak, uh, that is about building a fire and telling your story to the fire uh, Mm -hmm. once you're finished the course. And from her work, she was able to tap into the joy of her inner child for the first time. And as a result, had two estranged relationships from years and years reconnect with her out of the blue on the same day. Wow. And as well, she tapped into a joy that she didn't even know was within her. And now she knows how to access it. And it's changing so many things in her life. It's pretty incredible when you are able to tap into that, because like you said, the subconscious mind isn't just about our trauma. What we don't realize is that when we I talk a lot about soul fractal healing and when you disconnect from a part of yourself because of an event or some sort of trauma that you as a child just didn't have the capacity or even the conscious awareness of know how to deal with it. What we often do is we say, well, that part of us is no good, whether it's been shamed, blamed, there's guilt, whatever it might be. And we disassociate ourselves from it and we try to bury it in our subconscious mind. But with that part of us is often some of our most powerful and potent aspects of ourselves that are needed for us to fulfill our purpose, our destiny, to make the most joyous choices in our life. And so we disconnect with this part of our power. And when we do that, we become obviously disempowered and we start losing that potency to direct us and give us the inspiration and motivation to make the changes that we need to. And so oftentimes what happens is, is that when we do go into that subconscious mind, and this is something that I talk about in my forbidden journey program is I like to take people on this deep dive and I act kind of like a surrogate siren where I guide them through this deep dive into their own psyche, journeying into the parts of themselves and recollecting soul fractals, parts of themselves. And part of those are your inner child soul fractals and realizing that within those are your hidden talents, your hidden strengths, your hidden purpose. You know, the things, the gifts that you thought were meaningless are actually like some of the reasons why you're here and you need those to actually fulfill what your soul chose for in this lifetime is part of your growth and destiny. It's not just about the pain and facing it and moving through the fears, but on the other side of that fear is almost like a treasure chest, a treasure trove of gifts, your own gems that are just waiting to be polished and replaced back into your own crown of um, your own kingdom. Mm, Wow. Very beautiful. Really well said. I, I'm thinking about a friend of mine who's older than both of us. And she was taking a course on, you know, I'm sure you've heard of this old course, Codependent No More, you know, Codependent No More was this big book in the seventies and eighties. And 
it was taking her kind of like, I'm sure your courses do this sort of backdoor journey to get to the front door. And it ended with the medicine for her in this moment to heal her codependency was play. Hmm. And so in this support group, they were like, great, like let's practice together as a group of adults, like play. I remember this person being like, her first thought was what a group of losers I have to get out of here. <laughs> right? And she left and she never went back. And like, I said, that is the medicine. I just want everyone out there listening, like what Nicole's talking about, like, this is actually a big deal to learn how to play. So before we go into that, can you tell us your recommendations on right now today, anyone listening, how can they start to get in touch with this inner child and, and to have that subtlety of perception to know when it might be showing up? Mm -hmm. What I found with the inner child work is actually reconnecting with the inner child is probably the hardest step. Most people don't know how to reconnect with their inner child. And so it sounds crazy, but my inner child taught me how to reconnect with her. Oh, so nice. she is actually my guide when I help others reconnect to their inner child. Mm -hmm. And what I would suggest to anyone on their own trying is one, you need to think of a place that you loved to go to as a child, a place where you felt safe, a place that felt fun or exploratory or just number one, you have to feel safe there. So for me, for instance, it was the forest. Loved playing in the forest as a kid. I often, when I go into meditation and I try to reconnect with her, I first walk into a forest and then I really connect. It's really important that everyone connects first with their surroundings before they even try to call their inner child in. What you need to do is you need to activate all of your senses. And this is important because as much as you're imagining yourself doing this, when your body is part of the process, it makes it so much more real, which means you are now in the process of creating new neural pathways. And so what I'll ask clients to do is, okay, for instance, we'll just use the forest as an example. When I'm in the forest, I'll look down and I'll see, okay, am I wearing shoes? And if I'm not wearing shoes, can I feel the, the leaves or the ground, the, the dirt beneath my feet? And then I check in with the temperature of the air. What's the temperature of the air? Is it sunny? Can I feel the temperature of my skin, like the air of the skin? Is there a breeze? Um, is there sunlight coming through? And can I feel that? What are the scents of the forest? And I will run my hands across trees to touch the bark. I activate every sense so that my body feels like it's there, which convinces my mind that it's there, which now starts to activate new neural pathways. Once that happens, I then invite my inner child in and I always get my clients to look to their left because the left side is our more spiritual and intuitive side. And so looking to the left, I'll see my inner child standing there. And what the first thing is you should take note of is one, what age did your inner child just appear to you as? And two, what are they wearing and what's their hairstyle? Like, can you recall any of this? Does it bring back any sense of nostalgia? And this will kind of help bring you back into the moment and reconnect you. Then what you want to do is pay attention to the disposition your inner child has with you. Are they happy to see you? Are they indifferent? Are they sad? Do they look angry? Do they look scared? Like, what is it? Oftentimes, I'll ask the client to come down onto their knees so that they're at eye level with their inner child because children need to feel like they're at your level and it helps them feel a little more seen. And so you come down to your knees and I invite the, you to start dialogue with your inner child, just asking them how they are, if they have anything they'd like to share with you. If your inner child is nonverbal and not really wanting to speak at that time, that's okay. Don't force anything. Uh, if your inner child is open to you giving them a hug and they're, they're good with that, I highly suggest hugging the inner child and pulling them into you. And when you do, feel what it feels like to hold that child in your arms have their head rest against your chest, feel your own heart connecting with theirs, feel what it's like to have your arms wrapped around them. See if they just like let go and sigh in your arms. Like really pay attention to these small 
connection points, but they really are valuable and mean something. And they, they make you feel like really present and like, this is really happening. And that's, what's so important because as this happens, you start to realize, oh, this is what it feels like to be held. This is what it feels like to keep my inner child safe. And so if there's no dialogue going on, if you're not really getting much from your inner child, the next go-to is ask them what they would like to do. And if they'd like to have some fun, if there's a park by, or if they want to go to the water, if they want to play with animals, like whatever you can do to induce fun, that is the next step because the inner child may oftentimes people don't know, like you said, how to play, how to have fun and they're a child. And so maybe going into the work right away, isn't the answer. Maybe it's just about like, okay, let's just take care of your need to have fun and be joyful and build a connection of trust before we start going into some of the questions. Yeah. That was really one of the best overviews of this I've heard. It's not unfamiliar to me, but just such an important part of it is the embodiment, as you mentioned in the sensory realm. And it reminded me of Carl Jung and the way he spoke about the subconscious. And of course there are lots of archetypes, one of them being the inner child. And he spoke about the need for active imagination, whether you're working with the inner child or any of the archetypes that really honoring the part of our mind that is imagination. And it's like, we reach a certain age and we kind of throw that out as a useless child's play. And I'm a PhD student dropout. <laughs> I dropped out of, of Jungian psych school, but in my foray into that, one of my favorite things I learned was that Jung had the biggest breakthroughs that led to the theories that we all love today. When he, I can't remember if he did this for six months or six years, but there was this period in his life where he became a child again and literally embodied what you're saying. He went down by this river and just played with mud and made little mud houses and little mud people. And he was like, he didn't use the same language that you're using or that I might use from a different lens, but it was very much this, that I was letting that unconscious, almost animalistic primal part of me do whatever the body wanted and whatever the, that kind of primary mind wanted. I'm wondering if you ever take it outside of the realm of the meditative or the energetic and bring it into actual material reality. Oh yeah. There's different things that we can do. Like sometimes I'll role play with a client where I will, sometimes I actually have to play them and they play their parent because we're raised to respect our parents and to honor them and to see them as our heroes, right? And rightfully so. But when you're doing inner child work, you have to know how, when to get angry. And there's a lot of suppressed anger oftentimes that if you don't get through it, you don't get to the deeper stuff. And so what sometimes I'll do is I will help clients move through actual memories uh, I call it time travel and where we will reenact, we will reenact the actual event, but change the outcome, or I will role play for them so that they can see what it looks like to get angry. And it, and it's almost like showing them what they're capable of tapping into. So there's a lot of different ways of exploring this going through, like you said, going, tapping into the subconscious and go using your imagination is, is one way, mm -hmm. but also paying attention to one of the things that I cover in my inner child course is physical symptoms that you might be experiencing that are a result of emotional roots. And so creating a mind, body and heart connection is really important. I think that trifecta is there for a reason. And so really understanding your body is trying to speak to you and what happens when the body is finally heard? What happens when you start to pay attention to maybe the emotional issues that have caused some sort of physical blockage? And uh, it's interesting, even with a client, dramatic improvement in eyesight from doing this work. Doctor can't even believe it, but has to change the prescription. And it wow. was... Um, there's a lot of different ways of going. I was going to actually bring that up because in Ayurveda, you know, I studied Ayurvedic medicine. And 
one of the things that we are talking about this week is a practice called Buddha Shuddhi, which means the purification of the ghosts. And everyone gets kind of freaked out by that, but it's a shamanic practice where you're clearing out the traces of the past that are woven into the emotion slash energy slash physiology. And the inner child is actually a really important archetype in the healing of physiology because the energy that's released from the inner child energy being released is youth, right? It's vitality. It's when we're young, we tend to be really healthy, right? And that depletes as we age. So I personally have done 20 years of this stuff. And I can tell you like all my issues aren't resolved completely, but pretty dramatic shifts. And I've even felt vitality immediately. It's like a bubble pops. It's like, suddenly there's this energy, this fundamental life force energy, when you can allow something to move that you have unconsciously or consciously said no to. And I think I try, and I'm sure you do too, not to make any big promises, right? Like we don't know, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, everyone's unique. Everyone's got their own blueprint and um, what works for one person doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for the other. It doesn't mean it was wrong for both parties. It just means there's a different way that's going to be good for you. Yeah, right. Uh, and it's interesting too, because I myself have healed reproductive issues that have plagued me since I was a teenager to the point of one of my strong issues with inner child healing was I got deeper into it. I uncovered that I was, and I had no idea. I had no recollection until I was about 41, 42, that I was sexually abused as uh, a five or six year old. Mm. And that only came up as I healed actually the, I had black spots on my cervix and I did a lot of emotional release I didn't know exactly what I was releasing. I just tapped into the emotions and felt them. I didn't allow my mind to try to understand it, to judge it, to figure it out. I just felt it and um, used colors and light and imagination and all that. And within a year, all the black spots were gone. But because I had moved through that layer, that's when the memories started to come through. And so the healing journey is so interesting. We really are only given what we're ready to handle. But as we do more healing, we get stronger, we have more tools, and we're able to navigate the deeper stuff, which ultimately, as we do go into, will uh, uncover even greater gifts within us. Wow. First of all, listeners, if you're listening, Nicole, I thought you were like 23. And I was just like sitting with this like, savant, like this youthful savant, like you look so young. I don't even, I can't even believe it when you said 42, 41. So that is so similar to me. And that kind of takes us into this next topic that I have for you, which is the other place that you spend a lot of time, which we do, we have a whole, you know, feminine form Ayurveda school. And we do a whole month on the womb because of the ancient knowledge. And now folks like you and I doing this sort of deep intuitive work around what our foremothers in the past always knew that this womb space is so, so important. And so maybe speak to why that organ in particular, you say is a portal to unlock the universe's hidden mysteries. That's, that's a big statement. And I agree with you, but I would love to hear your perspective on that. Well, yeah, I, use plant medicine. I've done some ayahuasca journeys and I also work with mushrooms. And on a mushroom journey, I was guided to take my conscious awareness from my pineal gland, drop it down through my heart and to drop into my own womb space and to sit in the space of my own womb and sit in the eternal waters of my own womb space and feel cradled and feel held. And he said, let go whatever was guiding me was just like, let go. And so I saw myself in my own womb space. And as I did, I saw all these light language symbols kind of lit up and floating down and hitting the wa the waters of the womb around me. And as I fully surrendered, I saw a portal open up from the womb, almost like a planetarium where I could see the entire galaxy. And I was now in the galaxy and I was able to answer or ask any question and receive any answer I wanted. And I met um, one of my guides in here and she downloaded me 
with all of this incredible information about how important the womb is and why we actually, it was interesting that the male's job is to protect the most important portal of this planet, which is the womb space, the woman. And this is why there is this idea of like women must be protected and and all of this stuff. And it's not because we're weak or we're, it's not, it has nothing to do with that. It's the sacredness of what we hold in our body. I believe our bodies are incredible technologies. And so when I, when I dropped into my own womb space, I was shown that this was a way for me to open up my intuition and to help others open up their own intuition, but to also realize that it's a portal of creativity. It's a portal of other life form and that there was so much available to us through this. And I started receiving all these different goddess codes to awaken this area, to increase fertility. They said the more that we work with our womb and we work with this goddess frequency, we actually increase our own fertility whether it's women who are wanting to have children or just wanting to birth some project into the world, a business or some something, anything you want. And it was just extremely powerful. And so now I work a lot with the womb space. I designed a course called the womb of activation, which because we have these, I believe that, you know, we come from the stars and that there are these higher level beings coming into the planet, that they're coming in with a higher consciousness than we did when we came in. And in order to hold that frequency within our own bodies and not miscarry, we can actually bring in these higher frequency beings by becoming more high frequency within this area and allowing it to support the children that are coming in to do the great work on this planet. Mm, yeah. I mean, we'll definitely provide a link for our listeners to your website where people can find these courses. And I want to also share, we have thousands of people, they're all women in the Shakti school. And, and right now the buzzwords plant medicine, right? And so we've had like the founder of Apollo has been on our show speaking about psychedelics. And like, I, I love this whole realm of the deeper meaning of psychedelia, meaning to like have the mind expanded, which is actually the meaning of the word Tantra, which is the philosophy I've, I primarily have been studying. And when people ask me like, what is it about Shakti school? Or I call it feminine form Ayurveda. So similar to what you're speaking of it. And I say, it's literally endogenous ecstasy. It's ayahuasca, but titrated. And you're doing it from the chemicals and the and the capacities of your own energies endogenously, not to say there isn't time and place to go on a journey with the right, obviously the right support. And also that it's not for everyone all the time and, you know, all these things. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you understand and do it in a wise way. But why I mentioned that is that I had a very similar experience to what you shared about the second chakra or the womb space through years and years and years of building up the prana, moving the energy there, moving the consciousness there, continuing to move my egoic mental cogitating minds, like one degree to the left to the energetic world. In other words, these psychedelic experiences are available through so many different forms. I want to say that because I think people sometimes poo poo people's experiences when they're on some type of mind altering drug. But if you do enough energy-based meditation, you're also going to have that same similar outcome. Mm -hmm. And I had similar, you know, we all have our unique experience, but it is in Ayurvedic medicine, second chakra is called the Swadhisthana, the the seat of being situated in the truth of her, Mm -hmm. right? Highest feminine wisdom. And so learning how to just be in that. And it's the second chakra is water. So that oceanic realm. And it's just interesting to see those parallels. Yeah. And most people don't even go down there. It's like a dark zone. It's frozen. A lot of people's energy there is frozen. And I say that just because it is water. And so it becomes like ice. Exactly. That's how I was in my early twenties. When I started working with a 20, I started using naturopathy to work with this area. And I'm Really glad you said that because, you know, my first experience with Kundalini was at 31 during a meditation 
Mm -hmm. uh, where I literally was almost certain I was levitating off the ground and I had all this Kundalini energy activate and moving up my spine to the point where as soon as it hit my heart chakra, it was so intense and so scary for me. I thought my head was going to blow off my head that I had to shut it all down. Yeah, I get it. And, and, and I, and so I was like, Oh my God, I don't know what this is, but what the plant medicine can also do is sometimes it can give you access to something you didn't even know existed. And then once you know it's there, you can start to create your own way of connecting with it. Coming back. So for instance, now my Kundalini energy, I can turn it on like this. I can activate it. I don't need any plant medicine to do that. In fact, while during a retreat a few months ago, I was guiding people through their own journey and I felt just as activated and hot as all of them. I tapped into the medicine frequency and is able to move and guide and do all of that. Well, I was like, wow, this is wild. (laughs) You know, like this is insane, but it's, you know, it's there for people if they feel called to it, but if you're not called to it, then there's, there's so many other ways. I mean, the lungs have the capacity to produce so much DMT Mm -hmm. through breath work. Right. And so, I mean, I did breath work just a month ago. I was at this breath work workshop and through it, I had one of the most psychedelic experiences where I literally started to, with my own physical eyes, see someone in front of me starting to shape shift. And I saw all these different versions of her coming through. And it was just because I had released all this DMT through the breath and activated that. And so there's so many different ways. And I think you're going to know as an individual and you should trust yourself as an individual on what you feel called to and what you don't feel called to because everyone's path is, is going to be different. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. These ancient yogis with their breath work and their visualizations knew something, you know, that I think now because of the dire situation that many people find themselves in, in the world are beginning to come back to as, as the material world becomes I describe it as the front body is your material reality and the back, when we work energetically in the back body, this is the unmanifest and this is the realm of ultimate potential. And so if we're only living in the material, we're actually, it's normal that we don't even have an inkling of an understanding of what's even possible. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's just a good place to, to close. How have you seen these practices or whatever really comes to mind in terms of becoming a magnet for, and a, I'm so bored with the word manifest, but, but really being a co-creative partner in moving out of what I'm sure you and I share this language of ancestral karma, trauma, drama, that really does keep us in this limited version of what's possible. What was the question? How do I, <laughs> there wasn't one, Nicole. No. Oh. Um, yeah. The, just the way in which doing inner child work, Mm -hmm. doing womb work, whatever form of, for me, this is very much the feminine form, like of meditation, right? Like I call masculine form when you sit there and you walk, you become empty and you watch your thoughts. Feminine form gets very involved, right? You spoke about imagination, energy, downloads, codes, light, this is the feminine. And so how does the practice create a situation where it is more likely to be able to bring more of what you want. Well, I would actually say you want to balance out your masculine and your feminine. So masculine energy to me is the discipline. It's the routine. It's the ritual. It's the showing up, right? But then once you create the container Mm. for you to sit in, then it's like, okay, now you've done all the things and now you're free to just explore and go into that very you know, for lack of a better word, kind of chaotic, but very creative, you know, energy. And I have found one of the most powerful ways to be a co-creator in your world is through, oh, I don't want to swear, but like, swear, you can say fucking have fun. Like yeah. let it, let her fly, let her free. Like I listen to music in the morning when I'm in my meditation that makes me dance on my meditation cushion. I like, I want every cell in my body to smile. 
I want to feel in love with the morning, in love with the day, in love with this moment. And when you allow yourself, and that's that Kundalini energy, when you, and that's that goddess energy, when you are in love with that pleasure principle, Okay. And you can tap into that. That's where you become a fucking creator. You know, like that's where you're like, uh, like you tap into a power that has been tried to shut down by through the millennia, through patriarchy, through religion, through all the different things. And when you tap into that and you let it fly, like there is no stopping you. And so, you know, clear, doing the work to clear that space, clear the shame, clear the guilt, clear the denial, all that stuff. But then like, don't forget about the pleasure. Don't forget about her magnetism, how she can just allure and be so tempting. And, you know, in all the right ways, you know, we think of tempting as this evil thing, but it's not like you can be really tempting to so all the beautiful things that you want to pull into your life. And when you tap into that frequency, it's like, oh, nothing is denied of you. Oh, well, you just gave me an injection of it. And it's so funny because, you know, I think obviously you're both women sitting here together and there is this natural dance of the masculine and feminine, even unconsciously that exists between us. And so as you were saying that, I had no idea what you're about to say, but I immediately went to your opposite place. You were about to say, fucking have fun. And in my mind, I was saying, completely surrender and let everything go. Just be so empty. And you were like so full. And so it was just like, that is the beauty of, of love really of divinity. It's that it is Buddha said, you know, both totally empty and in the emptiness, there is that like infinite fullness and play. And I think, I think we dance that every single day, like knowing when is the time to like turn it on and when is the time to let go and be quiet and and solo and empty. That's a dance that's difficult, but to be able to have the wisdom to know when to pulse between those two and maybe even find some of both at the same time. So, um, this has been just so amazing, Nicole. I have loved the way that you describe some of the things that are really near and dear to my heart and I am sure everybody's going to want to know where you are and where they can find you more about you. So maybe give us a a little idea. Well, I don't know when this is going to air, but um, probably going to air February. Okay. My website is NicoleFrolic.com and you can find me on most social media as just Nicole Frolic. Um, My handle, I pretty much was able to get that. No problem. I do have a forbidden journey retreat coming up in April. Uh, So if you're called to do the work, we are doing the deep dive. And through the last one, this is where we had incredible, like someone had their hearing after 19 years restored in their left ear. Someone had their vision, like come back super strong time travel. Like there was just incredible things that happened at the retreat that were life-changing for people. So if you're interested, that's held in Breckenridge, Colorado in April, April 24th through the 27th. But I also, for anyone who's like not really ready for, or not feeling called to the plant medicine journey, but is interested in the work of it. I have created a coaching program called the forbidden journey that I basically created it to mimic a plant medicine journey where we take you through that deep dive. And I act as that surrogate siren. And we What we do is we remove the guardian of the gate who continuously causes you to hit a kill switch in your life that sabotages everything. And then we go deeper. We do all the soul fractal reclamation and healing. And then it's about giving you the blueprint on how to actualize your destiny. So that can be found on my website. Amazing. Thank you so much for being on Spirit Sessions, Nicole. Thanks for having me, Katie. And I can't wait to have you on my podcast. Lighten up. Yeah. All right. Thank you. A big special thanks to Kevin Carlisle of Goodbye Gemini, who wrote this beautiful podcast music, and to DJ Juan Pablo Jimenez in southern Spain for mixing it and making it magic. <laughs>